afternoon, everybody. So I just want to counter a pillow on the best asset class. I'll start with Mr. Buffett. He said, if you don't invest in an asset class that works while you're sleeping, you'll work until you die. So take that in just love us. Right. I think you've heard a lot from Herman this morning when he said we're in the, the secular stagnation world and it's going to be slow growth and low inflation. Now, if I put my bond hat on, I think but that's a perfect environment for bonds. Because what's the worst thing for bonds? High inflation, central banks hiking rates. What Herman is talking about is central banks cutting rates and central banks adding stimulus. And Herman actually said, and I'm in disagreement with Herman when he said, well, central banks cannot add more monetary stimulus. Well, I would say to him, look at the Bank of Japan. You know, the current the, the Fed balance sheet is three trillion. Nothing stops the Fed if the US gets into trouble to take that balance sheet to ten trillion. Nobody says that. We've, we've got a history in Japan that that can happen. We might see it repeat itself in Europe. So I think there's, there's more fiscal stimulus that can happen. What we're trying to say to you is this is a very good environment for government bonds in South Africa, not necessarily for global bonds. Because you saw the 5,000 year chart. Global bonds are at an all time low. Why? Because central banks put 14 trillion into the market over the last 10 years. Right, so let's look, where are these central banks? When we stood here a year, if we stood here for a, a year ago, what would we said? Well, we said the Fed was definitely on a hiking path, the Bank of England was looking to hiking, uh, lots of our Bank of Canada would probably look into hike. We saw our own central bank, the Saab hike rates in November, which they obviously uh, changed last week. So uh, a lot of the hiking cycle, where are we now? If we look at where the central banks in the world are, are we surprised that the Bank of China, Reserve Bank of India, we know that they've been cutting, the Fed, they're all in a cutting cycle. They already had an easy stance, but they're cutting. Bank of Mexico, look where the Saab is. Saab's in a cutting cycle. Still Bank of Turkey. Now, Turkey is a, is, a, is a weird one. I didn't have time to put the slide in, in the interest of time. But Mr. Erdogan, very interesting, is remember, inflation in Turkey is 15%. What does Mr. Erdogan says? He says, I'm ruling the central bank. I'm going to cut rates in half in Turkey and then I'm going to cut inflation in half. I'm telling him good luck. I'm sending him a bottle of wine if you can get that right. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is the world is very receptive. It's a very good global environment for bonds. Most central banks are easy. Where was the big turnaround? It was actually the Bank of England. Mr. Carney stood up for the last year saying, Brexit come hell high water. The Bank of England will hike rates because the pound will be under pressure. What did he do two, two weeks ago? He said, Bells, bells, Brexit is a problem now. We will have to cut rates. Big turnaround. So that was the big surprise to me was the Bank of England. What we're saying is this is a good environment for once. Now we look at the US, and it was quite interesting when I listened to Greg Davies, and we say, we talk around Mr. Trump, and we talk around trade tariffs. And what did Greg Davies say? Emotions is a risk to investment if you can tie him. Same for the U.S. Love or hate Mr. Trump, we don't care. When we invest, we have to be factual. What is factual is the U.S. Why is it important? It's the base rate for world rates. Like it or don't like it, that's how the world works. It's the base rate. What we have seen is the 10-year and the 30-year rate in the U.S. Move below the Fed fund rate. So 10 year is around 2%. 2%. Remember, Fed fund sits at 2.5% at the moment. 10 year rate is around 2 and your, four, your 30 year rate is around just below 2.5%, right? Why is that important? It always shows to a slowdown in the US, and that old, old saying when the US sneezes, it's a problem for the world. Why is the 10 year, two, 10 year Fed fund's inverted curve so important, right? I'll say the following statement because then there's all these fancy theories that say, yeah, but not an inverted curve does not lead necessarily to a US recession, which is true. But what is the fact? The fact is, every recession in the US over the last 50 years were preceded by an inverted curve. How long does it take? Well, we don't really know. But history also suggests that when the curve goes inverted in the US, 10-year Fed funds, usually takes a year. That's why we think the slowdown, it might not be a recession, comes somewhere in 2020. So that's quite important. 
Then we look at another thing. We look at what we call the U.S. yield curve, the term structure of rates in the U.S. The point that I want to make is the difference between the 10-year point and the 30-year point. Now, remember, they're below Fed funds, but it's still steep. Two reasons. Why is that important to us? Firstly, what was the first thing that Mr. Trump did when he became president? He cut taxes. Now, what does that mean? If we go back to Government Finances 101, what a government does not earn through taxes, it has to borrow on the bond market as a shortfall. If you cut taxes, you have to borrow a lot more. And the U.S. borrows a lot in 30 year space. Quite important. Bond market does not like it. A lot more bonds coming to the U.S. Second point. In the U.S., housing, when you borrow on a home loan, not a bond, a home loan, a mortgage in the U.S., what do you do? It's not like South Africa. South Africa, we Home loans are 20 years floating over prime. In the U.S., you fix your home loan against the 30-year government bond rate. Right. So why is that important? When we see that 30-year point being so steep, we're waiting for the canary in the coal mine saying to us, housing in the U.S. is slow, slowing down, because it might not be in the employment market, because employment in the U.S. is strong. So we're looking for the canary in the coal mine in U.S. housing, and if that slows dramatically, it will be a good canary in the coal mine that the U.S. is slowing, and that the Fed will probably have to cut and, and do more stimulus. So once again, emotion doesn't like Mr. Trump, but his markets are very important. Then we talk about a low yield world, and you heard Herman name it, 13 trillion dollars. When I did the graphic, we weren't even at 13; we were still at 12.75. Now we are 13 trillion dollars of debt is negative. Negative yielding. You're paying to lend money to somebody. It's crazy. But that's how the world works. What's quite important of this is that this is not only government bonds. 246 billion of this is emerging markets and a big portion, I don't know the exact number, is, is also in corporate. So somebody said to me the other day, am I concerned around the quantum of debt in the world? I said yes and no. No, because we'll, we'll probably have more. Yes, am I concerned? I'm more concerned around where the debt sits. Now listen clearly what, what happened. And especially in the US, where's my concern around debt? When we had the 2008 crisis, the debt problem was in the banking system. And the central banks were forced to bail out the banking system, otherwise the payment system would fall down. What has now actually happened in the US? Companies have actually been taking on debt in the market to buy back their own shares to prop up their balance sheets, right? Prop up their share prices. It's big. In the first quarter of 2019, it was $250 billion. The problem that you have is when that quantum changes or that price changes, I don't know what it means for the corporate market, but there's one big thing. If corporates get into trouble, there's no responsibility from the central bank to bail out Apple and Google and whoever on debt, as it did with the banking system. So it's where the debt sits, not the quantum of debt. And that's why we're concerned around the size of negative debt, because it's also corporate debt. <coughs> right. Why does South Africa look attractive? If you go back to 1962, all the way back there, and you ask the old bond trader, he would say to you, he would ask you, <coughs> What is that real rate, that it rate above inflation, that the 10-year bonds should trade above inflation? He would say to you, 2.5%. Where are we at the moment? Well, inflation is 4.5, and, and the long bond yield is nearly 9. So we're sitting at 4.5 real. That's a good number. The last time we saw this was in... Sorry. The last time we saw this was in 2009. We're back there. The yellow line is inflation. The blue line is our long bond yield. We're sitting at a wide speed. And what do we say? And it was quite interesting when, when we talked around risk. Now, when I defined risk in fixed income, volatility in markets is not risk. What is risk? Is overpaying for assets. That is the biggest risk in markets. Because when the price moves up and down, that's not the risk. The risk is when you pay overpaid for asset and the market moves up and down against you. That's when the emotions come into play. 
At the moment, we're saying to you the prices are actually quite low. Inflation is actually quite low. And it's probably going to stay this way because inflation over the next three years, even, it's not my words, it's a SARP. What did the SARP say last week? Inflation this year is going to be 4.6, 5% in 2020, and 4.7% again in 2021. So over the next three years, we're not even going to get five inflation. And the long bond yields up at nine. This is one of the best opportunities in 10 years in South African fixed income. And now, now people are going to crucify you. For the next year. I look at the curve and we say, look how steep this South African curve is. So your 10 year point sits around close to 9, and your very long point close to 10. That long bond yield is nearly CPI plus 5. And I'm going to say to you, if you took a, a student and you said to him, well, you have an economy that's not even growing at 1%, inflation is at 4.5%. Where should that long bond yield be? Well, you'll we'll get to a number of six. <coughs> Yet we're saying the long bond, long bond yield is sitting at nine. So that's cheap. So we're saying, so what's in there? When it's this, so the curve is really steep. Interest rates in South Africa is quite high for the low growth and low inflation that we have. Why? Because we as South Africans sit close to a little fire and we worry about Eskom and politics and the public protector and the this and the that and the taxes. And we think that the bond market is a static thing and it just stays there. It's not. The bond market is priced for a lot of nonsense. Yes, Eskom sits in here. That 440 billion that would go on the sovereign balance sheet and on the contingent liabilities and government finances, that's not great. It's already priced. The bond market prices these bad things. It's there. It sits there. It's not static. Bond yields going to stay at 7%. What we're saying is that Bonds are a good investment in South Africa at the moment because of the high real rates and a lot of the risk is already priced, plus it's liquid. We think it's a good diversifier in a multi-asset class portfolio as well. Because you heard from, from Greg, we get very emotional when growth assets don't meet our expectations. But when you're worried about growth assets, why not have an asset that's cheap in your portfolio that gives you that diversification? Where we are concerned though is we know that a lot of investors are investors in credit. Credit at the moment is probably one of the riskiest markets in South Africa. Why? Because we believe that non-traditional credit players are in the market buying credit at inflated prices. If you can put it in, 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 in equity terms, we think that in some cases Equity type investors are buying credits in the South African market at like 23 P's. That doesn't make sense to us. Because the risks have changed. If we look at corporate South Africa, so if you go up on this scale, credit risk is increasing. What does it mean? The risk that we can lose money in credit is rising, versus when it's down, we can make more money in credit. In corporate South Africa, this is rising. Do we think this is wrong? No, what's happened? what happened to Steinhoff? What happened to Tongard Hewlett? What happened to Omnia? The construction industry, the mining industry. All these risks are rising. We are getting a lot more circumspect on credit in South Africa. We really worried about corporate South Africa in terms of credit quality. What's happening to SOEs? Are we surprised about this? Look how this is done. Are we surprised? Eskom, Transnet, Denel, Sandra, the water boards. We can name them all. Lots of credit risk in South Africa. Yet, conservative investors are investing in credit funds where there's risk. Because credit funds are playing here. So be careful when you are in credit funds. But look what we find. Not all areas are bad, and that's investment. What is investment? You have to sift through 10 tons of rocks to find diamonds. Right? Maybe this is diamond. The South African banking system is actually not bad. You can see it's actually leveled off. It's coming down. Why? Because the South African banking system is making profits, it's well capitalized, and NPLs are quite low. So people are surprised when we say, well, we're migrating our credit portfolios away from corporate credit and a little bit away from SOE credit, and we're going into bank credit. But bank metrics in South Africa don't look bad. So there are opportunities. So to tie it all in, as I said, we, we want to take the, the emotions away from, from investing, we want to be factual. Fixed income has got a definite place in there. And especially if you could invest in South African government bonds, believe it or not, yes, buy ESCOM bonds for all the right and wrong reasons. We believe you can make a, a good CPI plus four type return over the next three years 
without taking an excessive amount of risk. Why? Because South African bonds are cheap on a, on a local and on a global basis. And that's why we think the investment case is, is strong for South African fixing. <coughs> cool.